Our next panel is on hijab, bodily autonomy and women's rights. It's chaired by Lisa Murray Taylor, uh, Philia's uh, CEO. Welcome. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Right, I'm not staying here on my own. Come on, up you come. <laughs> Have we got everybody? Welcome, welcome. I'm rubbish with names and faces, so I was going to ask them all to sit in the order that their photos were up, but apparently we've got a tech issue for the first five minutes, so are you all happy? You all okay? Okay. So welcome, everybody. I'm Lisa Marie, and I am with an organization called Philia, and we're a women's rights, thank you, Pragna, thank you, feminist organization. And we work to amplify the voices of women, and we say particularly those less often heard or purposefully silenced. And I'm going to take a minute to, for an anecdote, anecdote, which is when Mariam has come and spoken, Pragna has been and spoken, there are a couple of other, others of you in the audience as well. And the first time Mariam spoke, she stood up and she said, we've never, I've never been invited to speak at a mainstream I take objection to that, but anyway, a mainstream feminist conference, and my jaw hit the ground. So this isn't my area of expertise, I've learned so much this morning, but it seems self-evident to me that secularism, atheism, anti-theism is a feminist issue, and we have to be talking about this, and we have to be building those um, links, those solidarity between the two types of um, organizations and so on and so forth. So this session is called Hijab, Bodily Autonomy and Women's Rights, um, I've been told to keep the biogs of these fantastic speakers brief, so I'm just going to say a sentence or two about them. And in full feminist fashion, we've worked out how we're going to do this collectively. So that's good. So I'm going to do a couple of lines about each of the speakers, and then I'm going to tell you how it's going to go, and we'll try and fit in time for Q&A as well at the end. So Fawzia Ilyas is founder of the Atheist and Agnostic Alliance for Pakistan. She, which provides a platform and support to ex-Muslims, atheists in Pakistan, and aims to normalize being able to leave and to criticize Islam. Now, I'm going to take 30 seconds because Fawzia asked me specially to say something, and I would like a round of applause after this, please. So, Fawzia's studies were stopped during her childhood due to family pressure and an early marriage. She decided to stand up and continue her studies, which she has done in the Netherlands, and she has just completed a law degree. And she says... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And she says, a bit premature there, Mariam. I hope this achievement will be a clear message to all the girls and women. Never give up. You can do it. So, congratulations. Annie, you've met earlier on, so founder, co president of Freedom from Religious, from the Religion. Right, again, Freedom from Religion Foundation, which is an umbrella organization for those who are free from religion and committed to the separation of church and state. What I liked when I was reading about you was that you are called a third generation free thinker. And I love that. So that's great. We've got apologies from Huzan, apologies from Hazar. Sarah, is it Sarah or Sarah? Which do you prefer? You don't mind, Sarah. Sarah Nabil, who's an artist, you can see some of her work outside, an artist from Afghanistan who uses her art to denounce women's oppression in her home country. So welcome all of you. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by hearing Rana's story. Then we're gonna move on to some questions that have been posed for the panel. I have to say, Marianne, wherever you are, we could have a whole conference on each of those questions, actually, but we'll do the best we can with the time that we have. So, and then if we've got time, we'll open up to Q&A. So Rana is founder of Atheist Refugee Relief, which, I've read that already, have I? No, provides practical assistance to refugees without religion to improve their living conditions through political work. A Syrian women's rights activist, ex-Muslim, born in Saudi Arabia, who fled to Germany in 2015. And we're going to hear your story. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mariam Namazi. I love you a lot, and I love all your work you do. I need to start like this way. <laughs> uh, for uh, talking about my story and about hijab, um, um, 
until now, after five or six years living without hijab, without niqab, without covering my body, sometimes when I walk in the street, I see my reaction in the, in the shop or the mirror, and I look to, the, to myself and I said, it's me, it's me without nothing, it's me. Uh, sometimes I feel afraid because I see someone different, but from other side, I feel it's like, I am, I am here, I don't cover myself, I am proud about myself that I achieved this moment. And I feel, I feel also that I want to share this feeling with all the women in the Muslim and Arab country that they are forced to wear hijab, forced to wear riqab, forced to cover themselves. The most something painful I see it in Europe that, that ch children had scarf. It's unacceptable. <laughs> Is it unacceptable to see a children wearing hijab? Uh, for me, because I wore hijab when I was 11 years old, um, I don't know how the society can respect themselves when they allow the children to wear that. I hope in the future it will be forbidden and it will be like not uh, illegal that. Um, the children have the right to live like a normal and they have the right to, to join them in childhood. Uh, about niqab, also I want to say something. When I work here in, in Con, sometimes I see women covering them, them face. I feel sorry for that. I feel like uh, I need to talk with this woman, but I respect her privacy. Uh, from other side, I feel like why, we, why the women, they don't know how they are them, uh, amazing, how their body is like beautiful, why we need to cover ourselves because uh, this ideology, because someone, they don't control themselves. For me, like when, when I see a woman covering themselves, I feel like the man, they can't control themselves. If they see the women working without hijab or without a uh, headscarf, they will like react like animals. And that's the idea, and that's my opinion about hijab. Job. Um, yeah, uh, every moment I am now not covering myself, it's like a wonderful uh, moment. Uh, in the summer, like now, we need to wear something like a fit in this uh, weather and uh, like enjoying this weather. So, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say a little bit more about your journey to here? How did you feel when you got here? And how's it been for you? And getting involved in activism the way you've done as well. Uh, when I come to Germany, it was like uh, three years planning uh, to leave Saudi Arabia. Uh, I feel now like Germany is my country. Uh, I have a little bit like a, a strong connection in this country. Uh, starting uh, doing this work, starting to be active in ex-Muslim and uh, atheist, atheism, it was uh, from inside that I, I feel like we need to do a lot to support uh, our, uh, our community. We need to do a lot to support women. We need to do a lot to support also women They come to Germany. Like example, when the women come here alone, without family, without anyone, and she need really our support, and she have like depression and other stuff. So I, I feel like I can't sit at home not doing anything. And yeah, that's why I start to do this activism and I am like happy to have secular uh, secular uh, atheist refugee relief like uh, the first organization helping atheist and ex-muslim in Germany I want to thank Jordano Bruno Stiftung to support us from the beginning which um, uh, it's, uh, it's it's to have this organization here in Germany and doing this work um, we are like until now, we help like uh, 100 people in Germany and 600 people outside giving support and information. Uh, for me, um, sorry, for me doing this work, uh, it's like from the beginning when I get support from the, our, our community, from Mariam Namazi, from Armin, from all the uh, amazing people, how they support me in the beginning, I feel I need to do the same with other people and I need to, to start this work. Yeah. Thank you, that's wonderful. Can we get some, have you got any more water? Thank you. 
So I think I find this in the feminist movement too. Women who've been through so much and hearing the stories here today, and they come through so much and they come out the other end and they turn around and go, right, now what can I do to help others? And that's phenomenal. I'm really picking that up here. And a few things that I've heard talked about in the background, somebody's saying, there's so many atheists, it's great. And, and at feminism as well, the feminist conference, like there's so many feminists, we're surrounded by feminists and atheists. It's absolutely incredible atmosphere. Thank you so much. So these very easy, simple questions that have been posed for us. The last one I only saw last night, so and that's a very interesting interesting addition. I'm hoping we're going to get to that because it's very pertinent in the UK at the moment. So let's start at the beginning. So what are the contradictions between women's rights and religions? This is a huge question. So take it as you like. So your expertise, your geographical area, just general area of interest. And we might see if there are any contributions from the floor as well to add to this. So would you like to go first? Yes, sure. Uh, so first of all, uh, I just wanted to tell something uh, more about myself because I think it's really an uh, interesting topic today uh, as it relates to hijab and uh, you know women autonomy. So I uh, grew up in the family where I always uh, instructed to cover my face and also my head you know so I'm uh, I was never supposed to come in front of any stranger which was not the case for my brothers for example and uh, also uh, for my father so um, just had that question in my mind that why me only yeah or my sisters for example or each woman in our society or in our family why not why they are not supposed to cover their face or their their head so, you know, to discover myself was really important that time. And I thought I should go uh, into it and I should discover myself. And then, you know, it was also some kind of uh, problem in the family and also in the society because Islam, it relates directly to Islam because Islam tells you to do that, to cover your face, to cover your head and to not come in front of strangers, for example. Islam. I think itself is a contradiction with women's rights where it suppresses women and it gives authority to men more than women. We women are not treated in the same way as men are treated. So I think uh, this idea of hijab or niqab is directly connected to Islam and then our society. Wonderful. They just had these ideas and they had adopted these ideas and they had uh, become such a so-called norms in the society. And then they, you know, uh, they impose those kind of tags on the women and they have to, uh, uh, yeah, obey these rules, which I was not ready to take them anymore. And I was the one, I think, in the family who uh, raised questions about the niqab or the hijab. We were even not allowed to pick up the phone, to go to the door, to check who is knocking at the door. So these kind of things. And I know many women um, in Pakistan, for example, or in um, Islamic countries, they are still facing it. They are not allowed. And most interestingly, a man, he can have four wives at a time, you know, but women cannot. And why not? You know, these ideas, these instructions, we are getting directly from Islam and we cannot separate this idea from Islam and the woman rights. So itself, it is connected directly to the Islam and then society, society has merged those so-called norms um, in us and they are trying to control us. Why to control our bodies and ourselves and our, you know, our face and head? No, I have a beautiful hair. I don't want to cover them. Excuse me. Yes, please. So yeah, these are the ideas which uh, our society basically takes directly from the Islam. That's the point. And I was not ready to, to take them anymore. So yeah, so that's why I am who today I am <laughs> in the way. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And this is, this is where we come back to, we're not fighting for equality. We're coming back to what Pragna said earlier on about systems of power and taking those down, because quite frankly, I don't want four husbands. <laughs> That's not what we're fighting for. So does anybody else want to add to this question of what are the contradictions between women's rights and religion? Because this is big. Have you got anything you would like to add? Well, sure. <laughs> um, I wrote a book about the sexism in the Bible called Woe to the Women. The Bible tells me so. That's, of course, a phrase from the Bible. Um, and all the major patriarchal religions, of course, are predicated on women's subjection. I mean, it's a cornerstone of all of the major patriarchal religions. Uh, I don't know as much about the Hindu, but we certainly are talking about 
as long as male is God, God is male, to quote uh, Catholic theologian Mary Daly. And, uh, you know, it is a contradiction. Um, the more liberal branches of Christianity that have moved forward with women's rights haven't done so because of their religion. They've done so because of women insisting that they reform their religion. And when you look at the history of feminism and you look at the history of free thought, it's the same continuum. It's the women, free thinkers, rebels, heretics, the unorthodox, uh, who refused, as my panelists have, to subjugate themselves to their religion that have uh, started and fomented the women's movement. And I think this is true you know, internationally, and it certainly was true uh, in the United States um, with uh, the suffrage movement, which was largely started and initiated by the women freethinkers, such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who wrote the Woman's Bible. So um, one of the reasons I'm a freethinker is because I'm a feminist, and I think that is often the case. Hello. Yeah. Would I you like to add, add something uh, to that? Yes, of course. So I think from my point of view, the most and the biggest contradiction so between um, religion and women rights is that the uh, religion, all of religion, so I'm I would, uh, going to say about Islam because I born in an Islamic country and I grew up also with uh, such as idea, but um, luckily I don't believe anymore in, in these uh, beliefs. Um, yeah, the most uh, one the biggest problem is that uh, the religion they uh, give the rights for the woman under the religion, and it makes so the women are the loser because uh, the religion defines the woman's right under the religion under Sharia and under the Quran, and this is the sentence that they restrict on uh, limited so women's really even and also the another problem is that the religion is really old and it's not any more um, how to say um, it's not more uh, responsive for today's needs for especially for women, and uh, for me this is the two most um, um, Contradictions that uh, between religion and woman's right. Okay, okay. So, and I think earlier on as well, someone was talking about tactics. I think Jimmy said strategy actually, but I'm going to use the word tactics. The same tactics are used to silence us and to control us, and and this and the other. And you're talking about commonalities between the religions um, in the way they subjugate women, but also some of these tactics being used, and like you say, for thousands of years. Um, I, I read somewhere actually that one of the first laws was carved into stone, and it was saying something like, what "Was it because the silencing us as well is about bodily autonomy, stopping us from actually speaking, using our words, and you know, freedom of thought, and this, that, and the other." And some of the oldest laws um, carved into stone, it says something like, and um, one of you will know this, you can correct me, something like, "If a woman speaks out of turn to a man." She can have her teeth smashed with a fired brick, and that fired brick must be hung at the city gate. You know, this has been going on for thousands of years, and, and, and we have to be able to speak as women. That's also some way that our bodily autonomy um, is not respected. So shall we move on to the next question? So how do women challenge these and attain bodily autonomy and rights? And we're going to write the answers down, and then we're going to be free from patriarchy in the next few weeks while we implement these ideas. So how are we doing this? We've got artists, we've got writers, we've got... How are we going to do this? Who wants to go first? It's another big question. Or how are you doing it? How are you doing it? <laughs> well, uh, as I told earlier that uh, first I ju just rejected these ideas that no, I'm not going to cover myself. And uh, moreover, I think uh, I am just trying to educate uh, other women and also girls because they don't need to cover themselves just because uh, Islam says so or any other religion says so. No, you don't have to do that. I mean, it's a time to discover yourself. If you are not doing it, believe me, it's going to give you trouble. Do not get controlled by other people. You know, that's really important. <laughs> because in the beginning, uh, when I see, uh, as uh, Rana, she also mentioned already that I also see little girls, they had covered their uh, uh, heads and also sometimes their faces. And um, it's a shocking for me, you know, because a little girl, 
I mean, kids, they are vulnerable. They cannot take decisions by themselves. That's why there is a certain age to reach, and then there they can take, uh, take decisions. So it all started from the homes, I believe, because parents, especially mothers, they give instructions to their daughters, for example, to cover your face or to cover your head and then go outside, or you cannot go outside. Why not? Let them reach, because yesterday I had an interview with a magazine and uh, there was also a question, what if your daughter uh, choose to do that? And I told them, like, look, I am just giving her time to discover herself. I'm not going to uh, put her in any specific way or to show her any specific direction, no. What I'm going to do, because me and my husband, we have just prepared our mind that how we are going to raise our children in a way so they can be a good person, for example. So we are going to tell them that, yeah, what is wrong, what is right? Do whatever you want to do. And I'm not going to tell my daughter that you have to cover your face. No, she, she do, does not need that. And also, this is a clear message for all the parents and also for women, uh, mothers especially. Because what you do, you just put the little hijabs on little uh, girls' head. And then what you are doing, you are just taking their self-identity from them. You are not letting them discover themselves, you know? So that's the way just let them uh, do and choose the way what they want. And that's important for them. It's not like you are doing them, uh, uh, you are putting them in a certain direction and then, because once I remember I told a question to a little girl and she was, you know, she was covering her face and, uh, no, sorry, her head and she had a little, uh, uh, how do you say, Quran here, like this, and she was, uh, you know, going to, the, to a mosque in the Netherlands, we say mosque. And then I asked her, I mean, it was really uh, sad to see her in that situation. And you know, it's a warm weather. And then, and I asked her and she said, well, we are Muslims. She was like seven or eight years old. Okay, that makes sense. But then I saw like, look, there are many women, many girls, they are Muslims, but they do not take hijab. Well, my mother says so. That was so disturbing answer for me. You know, it all started from over homes. We don't need to put that uh, tag or specific tag because maybe we do not realize that at this point, but intentionally or unintentionally, what we are doing, we are taking their self-identity away from them. And it's really bad for the children, I think. So what I'm trying to do, I'm just, you know, uh, giving certain directions to other people and telling them, okay, you are not in the right age, maybe. So you can decide when you just reach to a certain age, let's say 17 or 18, and then there you can make decisions. And I have same plans for my, for my daughter as well. So I had uh, made clear it already yesterday during the interview. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Annie, there's a lot going on in America at the moment around bodily autonomy, isn't there, for yes, women? Yes, yes, around abortion, is. things change every day. I can't keep up. There was another announcement this morning um, and states are going backwards and forwards and this fight is on. So you said that what you wanted to do with our time today is you wanted to take a few minutes to update everyone and to answer that question, how do women challenge to, to attain bodily autonomy? Yeah, well, basically the way that we challenge this religion control over women is to make sure that we have separation of religion and government. I recognize that doesn't always um, completely impact um, private Muslims who are worshiping and putting the hijab on, but certainly when it's required, um, we see these uh, kinds of um, uh, Islamist laws in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and so on it's absolutely incumbent that we keep religion out of government. And what really uh, caused my mother and myself to form the Freedom From Religion Foundation almost 45 years ago was my mother's early work as an abortion rights pioneer. And we saw, I was in junior high school, trailing around after her, we saw so clearly that the only organized opposition to abortion rights and the right to contraception in the United States was organized religion, primarily Roman Catholic, also the evangelical, Protestants, Orthodox Jewish, to a small degree, the Mormons, uh, working uh, hand in hand to deny women bodily autonomy based on their religious beliefs, 
that uh, supposedly uh, there's an ensoulment at conception and the uh, conceptus is a full human being, more important than the woman carrying it, but mostly based on, on women's subjection, the idea that we shouldn't have bodily autonomy or control over our bodies. And we have seen um, Roe versus Wade passed uh, this important decision in 1973 by our Supreme Court. And I'm sure you read the news that on June 24th, our supermajority extremist Christian nationalist Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. And within a minute, in my state of Wisconsin, the four abortion clinics either closed or stopped doing abortion care. And now there are 14 states out of 50 where abortion is banned or almost entirely banned, not even for cases of rape or incest. And by the end of the year, half our states will have banned abortion. And when you look at the map, especially if you're in the South or the Southeast, uh, low-income women simply will not be able to travel the distances required to get to the free states, as I'm calling them. It's like slave states and free states to um, get abortion care. So, I mean, there's nothing more uh, sacred than being able to decide if or when to become a mother or parent, whether to continue a pregnancy because all your other rights are dependent on that. If you can't control your, your body, you can't control your pregnancies, you can't make other life choices. So um, we're in um, a lot of trouble in the United States right now due to the takeover of our courts under the Trump administration. And um, it, there's no clear um, solution uh, to try to make sure the Democrats stay in power is one solution and get more uh, justices on the uh, lower courts, but the Supreme Court is a live appointment. So we have a six to three um, anti-abortion and next to go will be LGBTQ rights. They are going after the uh, 2015 decision allowing marriage equality. And all of the states are uh, introducing the same kinds of punitive laws against LGBTQ that they were introducing against abortion. And birth control, the right to contraception, is now equally endangered. So it's, uh, I hope it won't affect people globally, but I can't help but feel that um, if we lose uh, protections that we have for LGBTQ, this is going to have a huge impact globally too. So it's the moral of this story is keep religion out of government. We have a Christian nationalist um, minority rule uh, going on in the Supreme Court. So um, we, are the, we are fighting it as best we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've got... We've got about how to bring up our children. Um, there's lots of organizing going on in America around that. And, and there's something around... Um, Coming back to what you said, pregnancy, there's something about the structure as well, and that we're maybe not quite touching on. And I don't, I'm not an expert, I don't know how to bring that in. But I think there's a solidarity, we've got to show solidarity um, among ourselves as women in this case, um, across, across areas as well. So, like I said earlier on about the secularism and the feminism, and show solidarity where we can across different activisms, I suppose. But we have to keep coming back to structure and power and focus on power, and how, how, and that's a really, really big, tough, tough job. Another way of challenging is through art. So, over to you, because you wanted to talk about your latest exhibition, and some, of, some examples are outside, and how have you been challenging you. Um, women's oppression back in Afghanistan? Yeah, so I would like to first, before I talk about my uh, recent work on my exhibition, so talk a little bit about Afghanistan. I'm not sure how many familiar you are with the situation that right now going in Afghanistan, especially for women, uh, it's horrible, I have to say. It's really horrible. And um, um, I have to say we are facing right now, yeah, we faced also lots of challenges in the last 20 years that we had at least a democratic 
uh, government and we had the women at least had some rights. But right now, since the Taliban got the power in 2021, 15th uh, of August, the women's Even my gut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, because it's sad what's going on there. Um, yeah, and uh, right now the uh, Afghan women lost their all rights, even the fundamental rights. The uh, girls from sex class they couldn't go to school. It's um, the Taliban ban education for the women in Afghanistan, and I think Afghanistan is the only country right now that even girls or women couldn't go to school. I, I'm, yeah, there is some places, places maybe, but not like Afghanistan. A government where so 20 years, so lots of countries, the whole world were there. And uh, it's not just the education, there is a travel ban, the women, they couldn't work, they are not able to participate in politics and also in uh, society in different sections. This is the situation, what's going on in Afghanistan. And talking about the bodily uh, autonomy, it's difficult because a part, a, you are, uh, how to say, you are uh, working for women's rights in a country that even the women doesn't have their fundamental rights. And it makes more challenges and make this uh, way more harder. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm coming to my work uh, as an artist. Um, I, I, what it's not here written, I'm also activist, especially for women's rights and human rights. And I start my activities since I, uh, as I was um, 14. I start first with art and second with uh, my activities, because um, I think we uh, we are women in the whole um, history. We have very similar history, but uh, with some difference. Um, for me, as I, I, I born just before one year for the Taliban and the first time they got the power in 1969 uh, till 21, uh, I brought my um, childhood under the Taliban regime, the most worst um, government. And uh, there was always for me different world in the wo in the house. My I have to say my parents are they are not secular but they are liberal, and uh, it was completely different world. So inside the house and outside of the house, the outside the society was completely different as uh, in, this, uh, in my house. But this was uh, I was I'm really um, lucky that I was born in this family because I got. Uh, lots of uh, things from my parents, and then I encourage or uh, I start to working for this uh, for the other peoples. So, as an artist and also activist, uh, recently I had exhibition in um, um, Kinsala Mannheim. Uh, this is an art museum in uh, Mannheim, and uh, I make a work uh, that you will going to see it after this when we are going to finish with the panel. Uh, I did a performance, and uh, because what's going on on South Afghanistan, it uh, directly uh, affected me and had influence on me. And I'm also in contact with two big communities in Afghanistan, artists and also women rights activists. And every day I'm getting, so how the situation is horrible on how uh, hard it is to be a woman and under the regime, the Taliban, they are terrorists on the Islamic groups. Uh, so, as a first, as a human, I'm also I prefer to uh, the people call me first. I'm a human. Before that, I'm a woman. I'm a human, and uh, it makes me also, um, yeah. So before that, I go, and I did this performance. And this performance is like uh, about uh, since one year the Taliban gradually, but really fast. They completely. Uh, remove the woman from the society as they cover their faces on their bodies with long hijab. Uh, I'm not sure what is this, but they call this is hijab. Like this, they also remove them from the society. And I said, okay, what can I do as a artist and the same time as an activist? And I did this performance. On this performance is about the uh, I'm. Um, how to say, I have my protest and uh, I'm standing against all the rule and laws which are coming, first of all, from religion, 
second from the governments and third from the patriarchy uh, society that they are uh, limiting women and the same time they are making uh, separations uh, and the woman they are bringing more pressure and uh, to uh, yeah this is about um, yeah this protests or this uh, performances about this topic So I think you're hearing that there are many different ways of, of fighting and of doing activism. And we're having a conversation before and, and making sure we're having those conversations out there because the journeys that you've all taken and that we've heard earlier on and we're going to hear later are hard enough. But you need to know you actually can make that journey, if that makes sense. So I didn't find feminism until I was 39. No one mentioned feminism. So if no one mentions atheism, that it's even an option. So we need to keep talking where it's safe to do so. We, we, we just need to keep having those conversations so that when somebody's ready, they know there's an alternative way of looking at the world. So let's keep having those conversations. So, okay, this question. I think we know the answer to this. Someone touched on it earlier on. What is the purpose of the hijab and burqa? Anybody want to do this in one sentence? And I might ask a couple from the audience as well. The purpose for me is only controlling the women and uh, wishing them brain that they are not equal to the man. They, they see them f themselves not equal to the man and they, they keep this idea inside them. And uh, niqab, special niqab, they, they, they remove the woman from the society. You don't see her feeling, you don't see her, her emotional, you don't see her face. It's completely out from the society. And the hijab or niqab is the same idea. Does anybody want to add to that? Has anyone got anything different to say? Okay, uh, so far what, uh, what I see actually, it is, uh, as you also mentioned, that it is a tool to control women uh, because, uh, you know, when you just uh, put some kind of tag on a woman, so you are trying to control them. Why it is not for the men? Why we are always being, uh, you know, told to cover our face and our uh, head, for example, and our body. That's not important. I don't see them in this way. And it has also influenced, um, if I talk about my country, Pakistan, so there is influence of these uh, uh, Islamic clerics, for example. So what they are doing, uh, you know, if government uh, uh, of Pakistan try to take any decision, then these Islamic clerics, you know, they just get active and they uh, create mess and they do not let those leaders or the decision makers to take any decision for the woman, for example. I don't know. I'm. I still have doubts in the uh, yeah uh, uh, government of Pakistan, but still, you know, they are there to take decisions for the betterment of Pakistan and also the women. But yeah, it is not. Uh, they are not letting them happen. So most important thing is if the state and the religion is separate. You know, and these uh, mullahs, for example, or the Islamic clerics, if they have less influence in the politics of any state, let's say in Pakistan, for example, so maybe there can we can expect some uh, achievements and also some betterment for the society. But it's not the case. What you are doing, you are trying to pass those rules to make decisions um, on behalf of. Uh, these authorities, you know, and you are trying to control women in that way. And that's not a nice thing. I think this is the worst part there. So it shouldn't happen. But unfortunately, I'm not seeing any difference or because uh, recently I was reading a news uh, in the newspaper and I was uh, reading that women in Pakistan, now they have they are trying to introduce a new dress code in Pakistan in colleges and also in schools. And they are uh, saying like women need to cover their head and for example, their face. And this is the situation of our uh, uh, educational institutions in Pakistan. I don't know if it's the same in um, our neighborhood in India or I, I, I don't believe it it shouldn't happen but yeah you know it is growing so why these decisions are coming from these Islamic clerics they have a lot of influence in the politics of Pakistan and now they in this way they are also trying to control women and what they are doing they are making them normal which is not normal in my opinion and shouldn't be normal in any way no never Thank you. Sarah, is there anything you want to add to that? Sarah, is there anything you would add to that? What is the purpose of hijab and burqa? 
Um, I think uh, the first thing, yeah, it's the controlling of women. And second thing, always when I'm on the street and I'm seeing a woman with a hijab or the full hijab, there is also lots of hijabs. It's not just a scarf, there is niqab, there is uh, makna. I think it's in Iran, if I'm not saying wrong. And also it's uh, the full covered um, with the uh, uh, work. Yeah, of course that I didn't forget this. Don't forget a burqa, what the Taliban said right now, and this is officially, and I have to say it was so, uh, for me, um, as, uh, it, uh, it hurts me because uh, as I did the performance on 4th of May in Kunsala Mannheim, just after this, one day after this, the Taliban officially uh, make a dress code for the women, so and it was again this burqa. On the, yeah, I'm coming back to the purpose. Uh, when I'm always saying the people, especially uh, man and woman, they are walking on the street and I'm seeing the man is uh, completely free, have a t-shirt and also shirt with flip-flops. And be, uh, beside of him, I'm seeing the woman that uh, he's completely, sometimes it's really horrible that he's completely in 40 degrees or the 83 degrees here, that's completely covered with a, a black uh, hijab and you couldn't see the face of the woman. It's terrible, really it's terrible. And when I'm seeing, and it makes me, uh, hung, uh, angry also that I can't do anything on it hurts me what I'm saying because uh, I know that this woman is suffering and uh, so in with this a job and it's the for me this picture it's a sign of power power of um, this patriarchy and power that uh, men wouldn't or that would like to never lose it. And that's why they are always, even sometimes, uh, they know because it's her, um, it's uh, his woman or their, his uh, mother or the girl, because they know they are going to lose their power, first in the home and second in the society. They will never um, uh, support or uh, support the empowerment of the woman or the woman's right. And that is right now what's happening in Afghanistan. You are just seeing the women that they are going on the streets and they are fighting for their rights. Actually, it's not just for their rights. They are fighting for the whole country, but they are just alone. No one is, uh, I, could, I didn't see anyone in last one year that uh, they give a company for them and support them. This is only women because the men, on the power, also they they have fear. They have fear to lose their power uh, to the woman and also in the society. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have um, we have a filia volunteer in Afghanistan who's decided to stay, and it's very interesting that over the past year, at the beginning, it, she was very much um, it will be okay, it will be okay, and then gradually you can hear that those rights are being taken away. She's being challenged a little bit more on her way to work. She's being asked a little bit more about covering up, and she's trying to negotiate with the Taliban for tiny bits of spaces where she can bring women and girls into, and she's having those negotiations. But then she's also being vilified for that. So there's a whole conversation around that as well. So women in the audience. The women that I know, I'm thinking Pragna, I'm thinking Mariam, Khadija. Is there anything you want to add to that question? What is the purpose of hijab and burqa that we've missed? Pragna. And I think it's worth saying as well that coming from the feminist side of things, we tie ourselves in knots over this so-called Western feminist white face. We tie ourselves in knots. We've got, um, you cannot be a feminist if you wear a hijab. Hijab is a feminist statement. I heard that in the same meeting room. So we're not opening to Q&A yet, but I, I am interested to get a little bit more from the audience about what is the purpose of hijab and burqa, particularly from women. Pragna. No, I, I agree with you. I think the purpose of any of these dress codes that are imposed on women is about the control of female sexuality. It's at the core of, of um, all these fundamentalisms, including Christian fundamentalism, Hindu fundamentalism, Sikh, Jewish, Muslim. It's also about removal of women from society and everybody's articulated all of that really well. What I wanted to say though, is for someone who's worked as a feminist for 40 years, it was never like this. There was a time, and I call that time pre-Rushdi period, when, you know, there was, due to feminist struggles all over the world, globally, there were gains feminists made. Roe versus Wade is one of them. And there are others, many others. 
what pains me is when I see photos of the 60s, perhaps even early 70s, in places like Kabul, Lebanon, Beirut, or Karachi, or India, when women were freer, when they were not wearing the hijabs, they were not wearing the niqabs, they were not wearing any kind of religious dress codes imposed unless they were traditional. But we've seen a backlash against feminism post Rushdi, and the whole ideology, fundamentalist ideology, the right wing in all religions have used the opportunity, and I call it a political project, but they've used the opportunities that they've been given and the increasing powers to remove women's rights. And in all of these situations, the state has been complicit. And which is why you have a situation in America where a Supreme Court that is majority Christian, anti-abortion, can overturn something that women have fought for for so many years overnight. And that's what pains me about the struggles that we wage is I never thought in my lifetime I would see um, that we would lose our struggles. We would lose the gains we've made. We might not build upon them as much as we want. I never thought I would see us lose these gains. And I have, you know, and I've still got a long way to go, I hope. But I've seen the ways in which feminist struggles and the gains that we've made have been lost, are, are being lost. And, and they are tied to political projects in which women are also t um, used as instruments to symbolize communal identity, to symbolize national identity, and are used to build a vision of nationhood that is based on the removal of women, or, or, you know, the, or symbolize community identity based on the removal of women. And I think it's going to take a, a huge, huge effort from all of us, from, our, from, from women, but also male allies, to really defend these gains, because we must. And that's why I think that, you know, freedom of speech is a feminist issue, secularism is a feminist issue, Rushdi is a feminist issue. Thank you. So, so you see what I did there? I knew, I knew that if I brought Prankner in, she would articulate brilliantly all the things that are whizzing around in my head that I can't kind of find the words for. So yes, thank you, great contribution. So does any, before, before we come to the audience, I just want to check, is there anything else that any of you would like to contribute before we hand over to the audience? I want to thank every woman in the Arab or Muslim country trying to fight for her right and other right and put her life in danger, especially in Iran. For me, the women in Iran, they are inspiring all the women in other country. They know they get in the jail. They know they get killed. They know everything, but still they go to the street. They remove their hijab. They fight. They publish all the photo. When I see that, I feel like I am a little bit Klein, uh, small uh, near to the woman. And fighting for our right is not only doing that, it's like also helping each other uh, complete the feminist uh, uh, work and, um, yeah, not, not feeling like that we do enough. Yeah. Is there anything else any of you three want to contribute before we open up to questions and, and maybe have a think about how do we address feminists who ally with the religious right? Now, I, I, I want to bring in the audience, but the selfish bit really wants this because this is an issue at the moment in the UK. But I want to check that you have all, I don't want any of you to go away going, I wish I'd said something. Is there anything else that you really, really want to say while you're here? Not right now. Okay, good. Then my job is done. That's great. So how do we address feminists who... Oh, yes, go on. Um, so I think it was two days before I um, 
yeah, you know, it was 15 of August, so just five days ago, and um, a German media would like to have an interview with me, and the one of question it was, um, for me, it was somehow funny. Uh, she, uh, she asked me uh, that uh, uh, how, how it's possible to, uh, let me think about uh, the if the woman right get better under the Taliban regime and I just laughed and say I'm really sorry I didn't see any possibility under the regime or the, under the uh, rule of the people those who even don't believe in human rights on women's rights and making the situation better especially for women it's at all it's not coming in the question so in the same time feminism and religion i think there is a lot of a uh, big gap between these two uh, that's uh, i think everyone know <laughs> better than me what's religion on uh, and especially when we are coming in terms of women's rights what the religion say about the women's rights on what's the feminism and that's why i would like to also first say that i think that was a maybe misunderstanding so uh, i see a lot of a big gap between these two because religion at all they are trying to uh, limit it they are trying to make more restriction of I know from Islam, so when you just read the Quran and the Sharia and ahad, Hadith, it's all, the, they're just putting lots of pressure in the woman, making lots of rule and laws that restrict the woman. This is the only thing. And uh, at the same time, when you're talking about the civil rights and human rights and uh, women's rights with, and, uh, with um, democratic values, it's not, I think it's not coming together. It's d difficult, and there's lots of gap between these two. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mariam, we need to do a, like another feminist conference and secular conference together, and you know, we'll we'll just spend a week trying to sort of sort all of this stuff out. So, okay, I'm going to to deny myself the last question, which is the one I really want the answer to, because, like I say, that's very pertinent at the moment in the UK. And let's open it up for the next what seven eight minutes to the audience for contributions. But I really want to ask you to take advantage of the fact that we've got these incredible women up here. So I'd really appreciate if you've got a question on the end of it as well, and I am going to go to women first. And you have a question even better. Hi, well, first of all, I just want to express my immense amount of respect for all of you here. Um, I have a controversial question, um, slightly devil's advocate-y. Um, speaking about the situation of women in Afghanistan, um, to my knowledge, no government has so far recognized the Taliban's government. Um, and um, many of the sanctions that have been imposed upon this new regime are um, with the primary um, intention of, uh, you know, for, for, for the sake of women's rights. Um, however, we do need to be very conscious of the fact that um, the economic sanctions that are being imposed upon the country are absolutely devastating. Um, something like 97% of Afghans are now struggling with food security. Um, so my question is, for the sake of promoting women's rights to education, free dress, um, are we creating a situation of more harm where they are now starving, forced to sell their own daughters to marriage to be able to feed their other children, forced to sell organs, um, how do we deal with this contention? Are we, for the sake of women's rights, actually doing more harm to women? I would love to hear your reaction to this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, first of all, I have to correct something that uh, the Taliban is still not recognized by the world community. It's not just because of women's rights. If someone thinking like, this, it's completely wrong, I have to say, with lots of respect. Uh, there is lots of other issues so that the Taliban didn't get till now res, uh, recogni uh, recognition because, uh, and also we don't forget they are a terrorist group. If the, and they are doing a steel terror. They are not, they didn't change and they didn't learn from their failure what they did in 25 years in Afghanistan. And recognizing of these people, it means you are also part of this terror regime that will going to be um, uh, established. And uh, you are the people at the same time that you are talking about human rights, democratic values, and, this, and then recognizing these people, then it's, it's, it means that you are also terrorists. So, yeah, uh, but this is the, pro uh, this is the, yeah, it means uh, we are bringing 
it's horrible uh, situation right now in Afghanistan. The 99% of the uh, country, the people are uh, having hunger, so starvation. More than 22 million people, maybe in six months, uh, they will not having enough food. Or six million people are going to be die with coming of winter. It's really hard. But uh, in the same time, if the Taliban giving the gov um, power, what will be going to then? We, Afghanistan, going, it's right now completely for, uh, forgotten by the world and everyone. And on that time, when the terror, uh, terrorists get the power, I'm sure it's not only now uh, hunger. So um, it's a big threat for the whole uh, country, the hang hunger and the starvation. But in the next or the next year, it would be not only Afghanistan treated by the Taliban, the whole world, then maybe we will have the same. Uh, situation so 11 of September would be going to uh, again uh, repeat it. So that's why this is, uh, but right now also they are just, um, um, they have, there's lots of uh, humanitarian aids, then they are going to keep it uh, uh, separate from uh, giving the recognition for Taliban, and I'm sure there is lots of way. There is lots of way to help these people right now in this situation without giving recognition for the Taliban. Uh, and if the world is honest and uh, uh, how to say they are working honestly with the people, then they can find lots of way, and there is lots of way without giving recognition. It's not just the reason to. Uh, because of hunger, because of uh, disaster, that's human disaster or the de human crisis, uh, uh, we should give them recognition. I'm completely against this because there's lots of way. And we've got a question in the middle there. Uh, I want to add something oh, here because uh, when you say that, uh, uh, first of all, never underestimate the power of a woman, you know, when we say that there is a problem or problematic situations going on inside a country let's say in afghanistan for example you know why it is situation because it is also connected to the idea of freedom and also the personal autonomy and bodily autonomy and you know hijab these so-called norms uh, which a state or religion maybe has uh, set itself when we say there is a economical uh, problem for example let your women stand up, give them their rights, they can contribute into the betterment of society and also it is a good opportunity for the government to boost their economy, for example. So, for example, if you are not giving them sufficient rights, you are just, you know, putting them inside the homes and uh, you are asking them to stay home and do nothing. In that way, you are also controlling them. Let them do work, let them go outside, maybe provide them uh, a forum and uh, uh, you know uh, there must be a lot of opportunities for the women to go study a good education that's also their right but you know they can also contribute in the uh, uh, in the economy for example because you said like uh, there is a problem yeah yes there are problems in afghanistan which are going on and it's really critical but you know we women we can also contribute for the betterment of society and also the economic of any country so if you if we will provide them sufficient opportunities we are not uh, saying them to stay back and just you know um, take care of the kids at home and prepare the food and uh, everything and then we are also trying to control them when we will give them sufficient rights and the freedoms they can move they can go out they can uh, 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 you know study and they can get uh, better education and it is a way it is directly linked to the betterment you know so they can also participate in uh, maybe the economy can boost so these are also the other thing. I don't see, uh, uh, yeah, giving them or damage uh, their, uh, you know, personal autonomy in that way. And uh, I see no harm. I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, yeah, it can contribute definitely. So we've got a, we've got a very quick, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Sorry. So the women, those who are going on the streets and fighting for their rights, they prefer to die to have uh, Taliban. Uh, they are living under Taliban regime and have a bread to eat. They are preferring death as a having bre uh, bread. I have to say this. What what a choice to have to make. So we're going to. Oh, we have to four. Oh gosh, yes, of course we do. Oh, let the questions begin. I don't know why I thought that. Thank you. So okay. So is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I have a 
Now you've got you've all the time in the world. Because now. the people, these women are going on the street, they are standing in front of the Taliban, and we know who are they. They are very brutal. Even they are shoot them directly, but they are getting, uh, they are, um, they have also some arrestments. They arrested women, they tortured them, they raped them. So they did everything. But even right now, we just see that three, three and four days ago, even uh, all this happened, the woman uh, uh, go to the street and had the demonstration and won their rights. And that's why the people, on also the mostly uh, uh, women, they prefer they die with a pride, but uh, didn't accept this brutal regime, or that they that there there isn't any dignity for them to or to have a bread to have something to eat. But uh, I think they prefer to die to have. Why? It's a, a clear um, um, It's a clear image that they gave the world and also us all. Thank you. When we come to that question of choice and actually lack of choices, you know, to have to choose between those two things is not enough, is it? So, woman in the middle, you've been very patient and we've got 15 more minutes. Okay, great. I'm Arzun Aibi. I'm uh, from Afghanistan. I've been born and grew up in Afghanistan a few um, years. I'm living in Germany as a journalist working. Um, I just can support Sarah Jan, uh, everything that you say and First of all, I want to say that it's, I'm really sorry to see the European country, that American country, and all, most of the country in the world, they are not really supporting the women in Afghanistan. When you see how the women are suffering in this country, Afghanistan is the first and the only country now in 2022 that the women don't have a basic life in this country. And I'm really sorry to see lots of the feminists and the people who supporting feminists and women in European country that they are in freedom or American or, or whatever. And I, I haven't seen since one year and the demonstration on the street of European country just to support and to show that we are here and we can see you and we support you. Of course, the, and if you see the politic, what they did with the women in Afghanistan in this 20 years and now when the American or sitting and negotiating with the Taliban, there was no American woman go out to a street and said, please don't ignore, we are women. And why American women were not in this table negotiating with the Taliban? They ignored Afghan people, Afghan women, and nobody talk about it. And now since one year, they just ignoring. And now I'm really sorry to hear that they is it better to uh, recognize Taliban as a government or not? Of course not. You have this, you don't have this. <laughs> you don't have this right to say from European country, to, from outside of the country, if the women of the people in Afghanistan, they should have a, become a government like Taliban. Of course not. Taliban is a terrorist group. How should we accept it? And if you, if you try to choose the group like Taliban, government for us in Afghanistan, why you're going and worrying for your democratic uh, government? Why? What is that? Can you stop you. please this games with our lives? Thank you. And um, Inga and I, Inga's in the middle there. Um, we were talking about this the other day, about how this idea that for certain groups of people or groups of women, liberation is meant to look somehow different. Um, we want liberation for all. Are there any other women who've got questions or contributions? Yourself in the front? Yeah, so I actually wanted to say something about how do we address feminism and how do we I actually want to say something with regard to how do we address feminists who ally with religious right and far right with regard to what you said about don't underestimate women and how they can um, contribute to the economy and how they can contribute to their country. I think those are the ways that we can find common ground with some of these women is that they have a role to play in their economy, whether regardless of what they 
believe about hijab or women staying at home, that they are part of the country. Uh, and I think that your point was really valid about making them see that they have a role to play beyond just what the religion said. And you said that the, Sarah, that the, they're defined by the religion rather than and defined by the government as to who they are, their personhood. And I think by allowing them to understand finding common ground about how we can contribute that gives them personhood rather than being defined by the religion, which I think, and I grew up Jewish, that the way that women, at least that I understood it, there's men are people and women are just women. So if you understand and you find a common ground with people, it gives them a sense of personhood outside of the religion. I, I don't know if I'm being clear on this, but I just do think that that might be a way to find some common ground with people who are far right or who disagree with some women's rights, that you have something to contribute to the country together. I just want to clarify that I do not actually support recognizing the Taliban as a government. I was more just like, wanted to throw out a more complicated question. Um, yeah, no, fuck the Taliban. <laughs> uh, can I say something? Yes. Um, it's, it's more like a statement and then a question would probably follow. Um, the, the fact that feminism in Western circles and sometimes when it comes to the issue of hijab and the women's march, because that's the elephant in the room that we're not talking about, the women's march had been originally a, a very admirable feminist movement for me personally. Um, I don't know if anyone is aware, but sometime last year in the Netherlands, I was disinvited to an uh, event from the Women's March because I was going to talk about against the hijab. And the, the issue was um, that there were other women uh, who would probably attend this uh, event who were pro-hijab, so I was problematic. So I don't think that, um, so I think that addresses a little bit to how do we address feminists who ally with the religious right and the far right agendas. I don't know about far right agendas, but the religious right, because I consider religion and Islam as a, as a right, you know, religious right movement that wants to control women. So I'd like the contribution of um, the panelists about what they think about this issue of women's women's march and being very pro hijab. Good question. Thank you. Who wants to pick up on that one? I think in the West, the women here they don't uh, tr uh, they don't have the same feeling or suffering from the women coming from Muslim country. If you don't suffer there, if you don't live there, if no one is still your childhood from you, how you can feeling about the feeling to not wearing hijab and support this idea? You support this idea because you don't try it. I think no one has the right to, to support hijab if this person didn't try the hijab for 10 or 20 years. After that, he can tell us an opinion about that, but not before. I think that when, when, you're, when you're getting this movement, so the women's marches, some of them have thousands and thousands and thousands. So you're starting to see women gathering. You're starting to see solidarity between women. Um, and there's going to be stuff coming at you. And we can see this in many different ways where women are getting organized. That resistance to women organizing. And so we have to be really mindful of that. And how do we navigate this and not split everything that's going on? There's a woman up there who's had her hand up for quite a long time. Uh, I wanted only to say to you that there are feminists who support y your, your freedom from hijab. So we are not maybe so loud like others, uh, but we are here. We, we understand everything. So.
Inga. Women issues. And whilst we're getting the microphone to Inga, I'll talk about bodily autonomy. We're in a country that is supportive of prostitution. And as a feminist, I would like to say 90% of women want to yeah. leave the sex um, trade. So we need feminists to be talking out about that more as well. And men, I always take up the opportunity when men are in the audience, do not go home and look at porn um, because you cannot be part of the liberation movement if you are going off and doing that I don't want to use that word. yeah thank you I mean using pornography which is about the subjugation of women okay so I'm just going to get that in there oh you've got the mic now I'll shut up there are very many ways of um, controlling women and women's sexuality and pornography and prostitution is also one of those but I wanted to do something else I mean because I agree with you about this spectacular lack of support for Afghan women and since we have are so many women here, and even if we're in different countries, can we use coffee break and on how to organize a demonstration? So we can just meet around you and start organizing it and please come. So that's the suggestion because we are here now, so what what, what that could we be doing? The other things are just questions which tie in, some are pedestrian. How do you feel about ideas like banning a hijab, for example, in schools? A German women's organization called Teddy Fam made that decision, but it's really been chucked out of many discussions. And they said, on the basis of um, reports from women of, of Afghanistan and Iran, should it be banned for students or not for children in schools? How do you feel about it? Because it's such a hot topic here. And the other one goes back to alliances with the political right, because women's march and everything, we've been so let down by all of those who should be our allies. We have been so let down. I mean, the Tuts newspaper here is a major left newspaper, and it had an awful article on Afghanistan. It began by attacking Mazi and Ejad and went on to saying that the hijab is not a problem and liberation is different and it's just a colonialist idea that women and so on. So since all of these who should be our allies have left, let us down, sometimes conservatives, I'm not talking about open right wing, but conservatives look so attractive. So how do you feel about political movements having alliances with conservatives and being to the right? So we've only got two minutes left. Do any of you want to take, pick up on any of those questions from Inga? How do you feel? What was the first one, Inga? How do you feel about banning hijab? Maybe that's important for children. How do you feel about banning hijab? Yeah, Where? In schools? In schools. I think it was you. Yeah, well, I, I never support this idea of wearing a uh, hijab, especially for the little girls in the schools, you know. I uh, already mentioned that these are the uh, decisions of the decision makers, for example, and there is a huge influence of these Islamic clerics and it should not happen. So what we can do, we can only, you know, educate those, uh, maybe uh, those decision makers sometime. There should be some kind of uh, conversations and also uh, panels or uh, maybe the conferences um, uh, initially maybe on a low level where we can address directly these issues and tell them that how worst it is uh, to put hijabs on those little girls in the schools, you know, and they are also uh, committing a kind of crime, for example. Because uh, uh, I mentioned it several times in my conversation that a child, a little girl, does not know why she is putting hijab there in, in her head, for example. You are trying to control them, their body. You are taking either intentionally or unintentionally their self-identity away. Let them discover the, themselves, for example, let them reach to a certain age and then they can take their decisions. And also, I already mentioned that for the mother, it is really important never give such instructions because I know how does it feel because I was always instructed to cover my face for example my uh, head for example yeah I was not allowed to uh, remove my hijab and I know how terrible it is because I wanted because in that way I felt myself uh, different from other women for example if I uh, watch it on the television or uh, you know other women but it feels really disgusting it shouldn't happen so maybe there's also an idea or a way to uh, address these issues uh, initially maybe on a lawyer level and then we can just uh, uh, you know implement those uh, those ideas those issues and also the solutions on a higher level and address to those issues thank so you. we do not support this idea of hijab in the schools it shouldn't happen thank you thank you so we're going to draw it to a close now
Um, can we all just say a huge thank you to the very brave women on the audience, uh, on the panel here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Big hand for everyone. Thank you, Lisa, for, for hosting. Thank you so much.